For anyone in here who's a first timer today or you're watching online for the first time, my name is Alex Galley. I'm the lead pastor here at Overflow. Very funny. I'm not the college pastor. I'm not the youth pastor. We have incredible college and youth leaders and, and pastors and all of that. I get the incredible opportunity to be the lead pastor here. I am very young, so I know that's kind of strange for some people, uh, but I always have to say that because we have a whole community here in McKenzie who asks me all the time how I'm liking being the youth pastor at Overflow. And I'm always like, man, we have an awesome youth pastor, actually. His name is Jeremy Allen. His wife named Megan Allen, who's just led up here. They're incredible. Um, but I lead here alongside my wife and alongside a team of people who is absolutely killer at everything they do. They crush it every single weekend from sound to kiddos to safety to worship to our guest experience team to anywhere in between, if I didn't name you, our leaders of our small groups. Um, just incredible people. But Today is going to look a little bit different. Normally, I mean, you all grew up in the South, so you know this is the moment where the pulpit comes out and someone preaches. It's going to look a little bit different. Today is week one in a series that we have been promoting for the past couple weeks that we're calling You Asked For It. And the reason it's called that is because for the past maybe month, uh, month and a half, we've been kind of polling our church and asking them the question, if you could have your pastor preach on any subject, what would it be? Uh, because as much as I like to think I know it all, I don't know it all. And I don't know what everyone wants to hear or needs to hear, what we're struggling with. And so it helps me to know, well, what is it that you're struggling? What is it that you need to hear? And so we, we polled Facebook. We've, we've been polling our church for the last couple of weeks. And today, we're jumping in technically uh, to the first part of that series, but it is going to be a little bit unique. We have a guest a speaker in here today, I'll introduce her in just a moment, but um, this today was spurred out of the Facebook post that I, I just kind of threw out there a couple weeks ago and just asked a very vague topic. If you could have your pastor preach on anything, what would it be? The most responded to and reacted to comment on the entire thing was a girl who's from Hamilton, Alabama, where we used to live, named Kaylin, who asked the question, or maybe she didn't ask a question, but she presented a topic and said, I would love to hear a pastor or a church uh, begin asking questions and begin jumping into the world of mental health. Where does mental health and with our faith, how, does, how do we connect the two? Are they polar opposites? Is it crazy to talk about that in church? People who are dealing with not only depression and suicidal thoughts, because here's the thing. I know when I say mental health, all of you are thinking like a psych ward or um, suicide and while that, that is very real and people go through that, the truth is every person in this room goes through something mentally, deals with something concerning your mental health. Maybe it's not suicide and depression. Maybe it's insecurities about what people think about you, all right? The things we never actually talk about, but we feel when we walk into a room full of people we don't know. Maybe it's not that. Maybe it's anger. Maybe it's worry or stress. Uh, maybe it's low self-esteem. Maybe it is depression or suicide. The problem is we as a church, not necessarily overflow, but just the church in general, we've done a really good job at ostracizing people who deal with mental health problems. We've, we've said, oh, you have a headache? <sighs> Take some Advil. Go see a doctor. Oh, you broke your leg? Go see a doctor. You've got a mental health problem? You're crazy, right? You know, but you would never, ever in your whole life Someone breaks a leg, we pray for it, it doesn't get healed. You wouldn't say, well, pfft, you don't love God. Don't go, and, and if they go to a doctor, you, never, you would never look at them differently. You went to a doctor to get a cast put on your leg? We, ne we never do that to them, right? But when someone says they're going through a marriage crisis and they're going to see a counselor, we judge them. It's the first thing, we're like, oh, hmm. Glad, glad you need that because yeah, I don't need that, right? So today is, is an opportunity for us as a church to at least begin a conversation concerning mental health and uh, counseling and therapy and all that, how it can absolutely play a role in your walk with God and how not addressing some of the issues that we deal with will hold you back in your walk with God. Because for many of us, the things that we deal with have nothing to do with Satan and demons and all the things that we like to say that cause all that. A lot of times the stuff we deal with has to do with the fact that we don't know how to approach it right here, that we're struggling right here. And so today, instead of allowing there to continue to be a stigma 
around that subject because there's not one here at Overflow. We have a ton of people who've been to counseling, who are in therapy. It's not weird. It's actually great. If you want to be healthy up here, then what better way than to approach someone who went to college to help you become healthy up here, and not to mention someone who's a believer, someone who loves God. And so with that, today I would like to introduce you to a newfound friend and a wonderful guest of Overflow Church. If you would, give it up like only Overflow can for Miss D. Wright. And Josh, you can go ahead and jump up here too. As, I think I'll just use this one today. But as, as they're making their way up here, um, a couple months ago, but it was actually just a couple weeks ago. I'll correct myself. Let me grab my phone real quick. I have some questions on here. A couple weeks ago when we started talking about this, um, and the, the question was posed on social media. So like I said, it will be different today. There won't be a pulpit. What we're going to do is we're just going to have a conversation up here as if, as if we were all just going out to lunch with D. And, and I asked her earlier, I, so I don't have to call her Dr. Wright or Dr. D. She, she, it's okay if I call her D. So if anyone's out there is like, how dare you refer to her as that? She actually asked me to. So um, right now what's going to be happening is we're just going to have a conversation about mental health, about stuff that we go through, about stuff that we never talk about in church because it's just the enemy and it's just the devil. But it's not. It's really just us. And D, um, she's a believer. And uh, a few weeks ago when the question was brought up on social media, I was like, man, that's such a good idea. And I knew Josh and Chelsea was here for the 9 a.m. service. She's um, in kiddos right now. And I started asking them. I said, man, like, would you think it would be a cool, cool idea if maybe we got y'all up here and like, started asking you questions and maybe you could talk about some of the stuff that you've gone through in therapy? Because I knew I didn't want to preach a sermon on this. I don't know anything about this. I've never gone through depression. Not, not really. Um, I've never gone through a mental health breakdown necessarily. And not to say that, that, that I'm beyond that. I just haven't experienced it yet. And so I don't like preaching about things that I haven't walked through myself. And so I started asking Josh. And I said, I know, I know you've been there. And I know you've done some things. And, and you've, um, you have a counselor and you have a therapist. Would you want to talk about that? And he said, I'll do you one better. What if we brought our therapist in and actually talked about it? And I was like, great idea. It's, you know, it's like there's a, just a treasure of wisdom found in Josh Crawford of just practical uh, stuff that I don't always have. So, um, Josh, I will let you start off by, by sharing how it is that you met Dee and what she's meant to you. And then, Dee, I'll let you kind of introduce yourself, and then we'll take it from there. Right, yeah. <clears throat> we were looking for uh, someone and of course you know as a church we've been through some seasons uh, we've had some things going on in our church and of course um, I think with that along with everything else in my life <clears throat> that I've pushed and pushed and pushed down I got to a point to where I just really felt overwhelmed uh, I was in a really really bad place of just depression and just I wasn't very motivated and I was just struggling because I, I want to figure everything out so I was at a place where I couldn't anymore and so I, I actually told my wife, who had been begging me to go to counseling for, I don't know, maybe for 10 years. I don't know if she's been telling me to go, but um, I was too, too tough for that for a long time. But finally, when I got to a place where I knew I had to have it, uh, I had talked to Chelsea, and uh, she had seen Dee a few times, and she just kind of told me about her. So I just went, and I went with the mindset of, I don't know what to do anymore, and I need some help. So that's what I told her, and um, I'm so thankful I met her. Like she's, she's changed the game for me in my life, and uh, I'm thankful God put her in my life. Uh, Chelsea said earlier that she went for a few months. I'm kind of a, an impatient kind of guy, so I've been going for over a year, and I'm still going, so don't judge me, uh, but uh, I love it, and it's been really helpful, not just for my past, not just for the things I've dealt with there, because there's been a lot of things I've had to unlock uh, because of some things that have happened to me as a kid, and uh, but for my present as well. She's really helped me navigate through how to do some things differently, how to be better. I wanted to be a better person. I wanted to be a better dad and a husband and a better leader. And she's, man, she's carved so many things out of me and helped me in so many ways, for sure. Well, Miss D, I will let you take it from here. Just kind of introduce yourself. Tell them who you are, what you do, and what, you know, what we're jumping into today. Where all the magic is. Yes, where all the magic <laughs> happens. It's not an appeal. Um, my name is obviously Dee Wright. Uh, I'm a licensed clinical social worker. 
Um, what that means is that um, as a social worker, I'm looking at more of the whole person. So like every area of someone's life and just kind of putting the pieces together and saying, okay, that tells me a couple of different things. It tells me where they are now and what's hurting them the most, but it also tells me um, where the root of the problem might live. And so um, not all therapists are created equal. That's really important to know. Um, I'm just gonna be a representation of who I am, not who everyone is, okay? And so um, when I take on a new client, um, one of the things that I tell them the very first day is that I'm pretty straightforward. I don't feel like wasting a lot of time, what I call pussyfooting around. Um, Sugarcoating things is real helpful. Um, you've hurt long enough by the time you've gotten to me, and so why would I prolong that Absolutely. by being all, you know, tiptoeing around? And plus, that's not who I am. Um, and so my goal then is to get them out my door. So not just to kick them to the curb, per se, but to say, hey, I want to get you to a place where you are well enough that you can manage your own life and you don't need me anymore. And so that's my goal is to get them to a place where they don't need me um, and, and can go on with their lives. Now, one thing that uh, people kind of across the board come to me saying is that, you know, I'm hurting in this area or this area, but the reality is is that, it, generally speaking, it is a spiritual problem. And what people don't realize is that we are both human and spiritual, and you cannot separate those two yeah. things. Yeah. And so... What we try to do as humanity is we try to say, well, you know, like you said earlier, you know, Satan's attacking me here, here, and here, and he probably is. Mm -hmm. um, but the reality is we have a whole lot more power than Satan likes for us to know Absolutely. about. Absolutely. And so in that, um, we, when we start talking about the spiritual side of that and, and humanity, so like the human condition, and we start to recognize you can't separate those two things. They go hand in hand and actually fit together like a puzzle. Then people start to recognize things about themselves. Right. So it's not really I'm all that in a bag of chips. Um, God obviously uses me, and I'm humbled by that every single day. But the reality is, is that we have more power than we think we have. That's Satan so would like for us to believe that yes. we don't have power. Yes. Yes. And that we can do nothing about that, but that's just not true at all. Right, right. So just go ahead, and get, just do this, say, I'm buckled up. Because we're about to go for a ride. Like she said, she is not going to sugarcoat anything. She's going to talk to you just like you were Josh Crawford, which means you got to be intentional. You got to be like really straight to the point. You, there's no like dancing around anything. So, why, but because. Why? Because we want to get better, right? We want to get better. We all want to grow. We, we don't want to stay where we're at. And so for some of us, for most of us, for every one of us, we need to hear things like they need to be said. We don't need people to say, hey, you should probably do it. No, 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 no. That is not how our parents, when they wanted to tell us something, they didn't ask us if we wanted to hear it. They told us something. And so today... It's, it's why it's great bringing Dean because she can say all this stuff and you can leave and be like, I don't know about her, but I didn't say it, right? So <laughs> I can always say, yeah, no, I'm kidding. I would never, I would never talk bad about you. So we're going to go ahead and just jump in here. Uh, now, in my personal experience, and may, maybe you guys have never dealt with this, I like being right all the time. Maybe I'm the only one who deals with that. I'm sure. But what happens is, and I say that because everybody in here likes being right. We all like winning the argument. We all like acting like we have it together and we know everything. And so here a problem presents itself in that because we never want to show weakness and we never want to expose our problems and we always want to be right and have it all together, we come into church the one place in the whole world where we should be able to come in broken and messed up and been kicked around, and we should be able to come in here and just be broken for a second, and that be okay, we do the exact opposite. We come in here, 
And we put a bigger mask on a church than we do ball games. And we put a bigger mask on a church than we do on social media. We'll tell all of social media about our problems and what's going on. But when we come into church, you know, we have to like tuck our shirt in and look a certain way. And so I guess my first question today is, why do we do that? Why do church people, the one group of people who should be pretty open to the idea that we're all sinners and we've all fallen short, and that means we're all far from perfect and broken, why do we have such a hard time opening up to people? Why do we have such a hard time expressing that, it's, that we're not okay? Well, because we don't want to be judged. And, and that's the long and the short of it. But the, the reality is, unless we really have a relationship with each other, we're not going to open up anyway. And it's all about vulnerability and the willingness to be vulnerable. And lots of people will tell me, I don't want to be vulnerable because that leaves me in a position where someone can hurt me. Yeah. Someone can get to me. They didn't know where my pain spot is. So it's like they know where the gunshot wound is, so they're going to press in on that. And, and nobody really wants to do that, and we don't trust each other well enough to do that, to allow that to happen. But it's in that vulnerability that engaging with other people happens, where loving happens, um, where healing happens. Right. Yeah. And until you're willing to be that vulnerable with each other, you're really not, you're going to have trouble. It's going to be difficult. Fantastic. Um, would you, so there's a power in vulnerability. Now, the, if there's just a power of vulnerability in general, would you talk about for a moment, because I think we all know that things get better as we talk about them. You know, the Bible is pretty clear. If you confess your sin to one another, then you'll be healed of that sin. Like, it, even from back then, God is saying, you got to talk about the stuff. But even with the people we're close to, the people we do trust, we have such an issue opening, opening up to them about this stuff. You know, even whether it be our spouse or our parents or our, even just our closest friends, would you just kind of like can build upon what you were talking about and the power of being vulnerable and, and being open and being willing to communicate the things that are on our heart or the things that we're dealing with, the things that we haven't told anybody, secrets that we haven't told anybody. You mentioned last experience about some of the trauma that comes along with not doing that. Would you right. talk about that for a moment? When you think about the Celebrate Recoveries, AA, NA, all the support groups that probably y'all are familiar with, the 12-step programs, um, what you find is that the reason they are so successful is because you are being honest, not just honest with another person, but honest with yourself. And so what happens is when you start exposing your secrets, when you start saying them out loud, many people have come to me and said, you know, I've never said that out loud. And wow, that feels good. Right. And, and so when they do that, they start unloading, if you will, some of the secrets that they have been toting around. And what you find in God's world, all things are connected. And so what you find is that the more secrets that you have, the more your body will begin to bow over and you just have no choice. It's the weight of the secret. And so in an environment where you can be honest, again, not just with someone else, but with yourself, saying it out loud, then you start to find freedom. You start to find healing. And, and so when you're vulnerable with each other, whether, I, I mean, I think y'all have, what do you call them, life groups or small groups or... Small groups. Groups. Yeah, community groups, yeah. So in that environment, um, you, you start to recognize that it's okay for you to be yourself. You're free to be me kind of thing. And the more freedom that you find in that, and the more willing you are to be vulnerable in that environment, you start to find freedom and healing. For us, we go to a, a West Jackson Baptist. I mean, I don't know, what's that, 3,000 members or something. And we don't really do church until we get to our small group right. for us. Right. Right. And, and so in our small group, we have, I don't know, six or seven couples um, that there it's free to, we're free to be us. And, and there, that's who we share our struggles with. That's who we share our victories with. That's who we share all kinds of things with. That's incredible. Josh, 
talk about marriage specifically. And while we're talking about communication and opening up, I, I know one of the things, and I am no marriage expert. I will tell you that's why I'm not going to be preaching any marriage sermons anytime soon because I've been married for two years. Like, it hasn't been a very long time. One thing I have learned is that just on the lines of being vulnerable and opening up, one of the things within my marriage um, that has caused me to either experience wild success or gigantic failure would be the art of communication in general. Um, not, not even just communication when like I've done something wrong, but communication I mean, literally just about anything, like my expectations, my, what we're you know, dealing with. And so I know, Josh, you, you posed a question earlier just about that. Yeah, because I, I fully believe we all want to be better. Like everyone in this room wants to be better. Like right. you don't want to be stuck in your situation forever, and I didn't either. But when it comes to like being married and like communicating the things that I could not communicate to my wife, because there would be some things I could communicate to my wife. Like my wife was the first person I ever told that I was molested. She was the first person I ever opened up to about that. But there were other things uh, that we've dealt with in this year um, that she that she knows happened to me, but she doesn't know how it affected me. So that was my struggle was like communicating all of my insecurities to my wife because I was afraid. She would not love me anymore. Like, it's, you have these fears, you know, like, of what, when you know the real me, when you see the real me, like, how are you going to handle that? So, um, just kind of speak on, I know we're going to change the word, which is good, but uh, the word communication, like, how does that play a role uh, in getting better and moving forward, especially as a married couple, I guess? Well, here it comes. <laughs> Uh, so c rather than thinking of it as communicating, because communicating can look like a lot of different things. I can look at my husband right now, and because we've been together for 28 years, he probably can figure out what I'm thinking or what I'm feeling. But one of the things about um, communication is that we engage with the other person. And that's a very different scenario. So as you engage with the other person, you start to not just tell them what you're thinking, which is the logical side of your mind. You're also telling them what you're feeling, which is the emotional side of your mind. When this happens, if my husband were to stand up and walk out right now, he can probably guess how I would feel about that. <laughs> not that that would be a bad right. thing. I mean, I get he's got to go to the bathroom, but... <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't necessarily think that was a bad thing, but he, he would know how I, how I would interpret that. Interpretation is a very important thing. We talked earlier about the angle of distortion. When, when someone tells me, I have to, I'm sorry, I have to lay it down again. So when someone tells me something, there's this message that's sent, right? But by the time it gets to me, this is what I hear. So in between here is the angle of distortion. This, what I hear, is based on what I already know about, what I believe about me and about the world around me. So it's my belief system that changes the angle of distortion. So some people, the angle of distortion is here. Some people, it's over here, you know. It just depends on what they believe about themselves and the world around them already. And so one of the things, thank you, one of the things that has been so helpful to learn just in being married for 28 years is, is simply the, the words, here's what I heard you say. Is that what you meant to say? And that's just huge. Right. So being able to stop and ask that question, here's what I heard you say. I'm a piece of crap for not remembering blah, blah, blah. And, you know, and while that might not, you know, this particular situation might not equal you're a piece of crap, you might, you know, piled on top of a bunch of other things that we didn't talk about, that I didn't tell you how it felt. Then the next thing you know, you're a pretty big piece of crap. You know? Right. Not you specifically, Josh, but anyway. <laughs> <laughs> you're right, he's an easy target. Like I've heard that before. He is <laughs> such an easy target. Yeah, yeah. It's only because he always <laughs> smiles and nods his head. Yes, so yes. every time I say a corny joke, they got onto me last week, because every time I say a corny joke, I say, if I was Josh, I would say this, because I was pinned on him. So just in case it doesn't go over well, it's like it's still Josh for some, somehow saying it. So, yes, anytime you need to do that, he is right there for yeah, you. Okay. Um, Chelsea, 
mentioned this when she was in here. I'm kind of taking on some of Chelsea's questions as well. She was in here at 9 a.m. Chelsea asked this question, um, and it's a concept I don't think a lot of people have probably even heard heard of or maybe even been taught on. I, I know I didn't, I had never even been taught or considered this as a thing until maybe maybe six years ago. I read a book called Boundaries, and what Chelsea asked was, uh, even because we start talking about relationships and marriage, and one of the big things that, and Chelsea, I think, would be okay with me saying this. One of the big things that she dealt with when she first started attending counseling and therapy was she, she struggled to create boundaries in her life. Um, she was, if someone asked her to do something, she was going to do it. And, and I want to make sure we, we are clear when I say boundaries. Every time I heard boundaries growing up, it was in youth group, and it was because my youth pastor was like, you need boundaries within you and your girlfriend. Like, <laughs> don't have sex. So that's not necessarily the boundaries I'm talking about. Sure, th those are very healthy, but there should be boundaries, not just between you and your girlfriend or your boyfriend or fiance or whatever. There should be boundaries between you and every living person on this planet. Boundaries between parents and children. Boundaries between you and what your boss is asking out of you. Boundaries between you and your friends, what they should say, what they shouldn't say, how they can treat you, how they're not allowed to treat you. The problem is a lot of us, if you're like me, if you're like Chelsea, we had never established and we didn't even know it was okay to do this. I, don't, I think for most of us, we don't know that it's okay to do this, to say no, right? Because we've already got 14 things happening and they need my help with this. And if I don't help, then the ship's sinking. The world is going to fall apart. And so because we never want to let people down, we always do what they want us to do. And then there are repercussions to that. So would you just talk about maybe just the importance of healthy boundaries within our relationships and stuff? Boundaries are something that keep us protected. And so it makes it possible for us to show up as our best self. And so if, if I am stretched too thin, then I can do none of those commitments very well. Like for me, I can be a great administrator or a pretty decent um, therapist, but I, I struggle at being both. And so I'm going to focus more. I'm going to delegate all I can, all that administrative stuff. And then I'm going to focus on being a therapist because that's what I really enjoy. It's what I feel like I do best. And so if people start pulling from me too much, if they start wanting me to do this, this, and this, and, and I keep saying yes, then I can't show up as my best self. So like for me as a therapist, if something too big is going on in my personal life, I will cancel appointments. I'll reschedule because I want to show up with my best self because you guys all deserve the best self, you know, the therapist to show up as their best self. So with boundaries... You're protecting you, and so you're saying, okay, what is good for me? So if I'm in a relationship with a toxic person, and I have several, honestly, several people in my family that are toxic, and so I'm going to limit how much time I spend with them because I know I'm going to start being worn down. I'm going to start, um, my body will, again, my body will start responding in a negative way if I spend too much time with them. And so when I show up, when I say yes to them, I want to first ask myself, okay, how do I feel? Do I feel strong today? Am I able to <laughs> keep my Christianity today? <laughs> you know, uh -huh. and, and if I do, then I'll show up and I'll say, some people I'll say, okay, before we ever get there, here's how much time I've allotted to this. And if they're still not a knucklehead, if I'm still doing okay by the time we get to this 30-minute mark or whatever it is, then we can stay a little longer. But if I'm not, then I'm going to be ready to hit the door. And so there's this idea the boundary is the time frame. Right. Now, nobody else has to know about that. I mean, obviously, I talk to somebody. I don't talk to myself. Sometimes I start it that way. You, right, yeah. Hey, happy birthday, man. I'm going to leave at 1230, so. Yeah, exactly, which is a boundary, right? Uh -huh. That in itself is a boundary. And so this idea of, you know what, I'm not feeling well today. I'm not my best today. You can say anything. You can, it doesn't have to be a lie. I don't feel my best today. Can we talk about this later? That's uh, something that's perfect to say 
in a in a conflict in a, a right. intimate relationship like a wife and husband or whatever. I'm not feeling my best today. You know, can we just talk about this later on? It's kind of like saying I got a headache. Right. Now, I know we have a lot of parents. Raise your hand if you're a parent or you have a child. Yeah. Okay. Great. Raise your hand if you want to be one and you're not one yet. Like we, most people in here will benefit from this. She mentioned this a sec, uh, earlier, and I thought it was golden. Uh, she mentioned, because, and I know this is such a hard concept for a lot of people to grasp, that even within families, close, not just extended family, not just grandma and grandpa and Uncle Rick, okay? Not, you know, like, of course there's boundaries there. Those are easy. Right. But there's also much harder boundaries within immediate families. So I've seen this a lot of times where there is a parent who will pick sides with their children, right? And what, what will happen is it's like the parent and the kid are pinned up against dad who doesn't want to spend the money, but mom wants to spend the money, and the kid wants to spend the money. So instead of, instead of agreeing with her husband, or, or it could be flipped. Mom doesn't want to do this, but dad does, and so now he's got the kids on his side, and they're all pinned up against her. But it happens all the time where we want to go out to eat, how much we're going to spend for Christmas, how long we're going to stay at the movies, whatever. It happens all the time. And, it, and what happens is, is these boundaries are crossed because there should be a boundary within parents. And parents, which just talk about the bubbles. Okay. <laughs> I don't want to spend the fun here. Well, thanks. Talk about the bubbles. So I think in pictures, so I talk in pictures. So to me, a family is within a bubble. So if you imagine there's this bubble here, inside that bubble, that's the whole family. It's the husband, the wife, the children, everybody. They're the, that particular nucleus, family nucleus. And within that bubble is a smaller bubble, which is where the marriage lives. Now, the parents can come in and out of that smaller bubble, but the children can never enter that smaller bubble. The, it, the marriage is the only thing that lives inside that bubble, that smaller bubble, and by the way, the children are not part of the marriage. Come on. I know, right? Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's so bizarre how, how we miss that concept somehow. And maybe it's just because nobody ever used bubbles. But, uh, <laughs> but in that smaller bubble, it's, it's where the marriage happens. So it's where big decisions happen. It's where parenting happens. It's where um, life in general happens. You know, how... Because the, ultimately, as the Bible says, the kids are going to grow up and move away. They're going to go away. The marriage is going to remain. And so in order for the marriage to still be there and to still be healthy, you have to be pouring into that marriage and investing in that marriage. Now, again, the children are not part of that marriage. And so I'm not saying don't parent your kids. That's not what I'm saying at all. But what I am saying is that as you parent your children, you have to be a united front. And here's why. Human nature. Babies, and I just saw a brand new baby um, in the congregation. So babies, from the time they are born, start manipulating their parents. Human nature. Can't help it. They get hungry. What do they do? They cry. Uh -huh. Oh, I have a wet diaper. What am I going to do? I'm going to cry because I don't like that. And so they start manipulating the parents. It's human nature. We all do it. So, you know, no need in judging babies. <laughs> so, <laughs> so in that, you have to recognize that as children are going to manipulate, you have to have a united front. There's a reason it takes a man and a woman so to create a child, and that is because there's something each of them have to give that child. That child needs something from both of them. And so as you do that, you have to recognize that they're going to need them to be on the same page always. Never playing one against the other, and the children will try because they're humans. And, and yeah. so you cannot, you cannot separate that. I'm sorry, nah. I went on a tangent. No, please, I was that kid. I know, I know that life all too well. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take a hard left turn here, and then Josh, after she mentions this, I want you to tell your story. Uh, it's one of my favorites because, it's one, once again, it's that like Josh moment where he outs himself in front of everybody, and I love that. So I do that too. It's what we do. Is that's my profession. I have to get up here and talk about all the things I'm bad at and make fun of myself sometimes. So um, I know for me, one of the biggest things I've learned in the last year, 
I, that I had never even heard of before was the concept of self-talk and how every one of us all day long we're having a conversation with ourselves. Not in a crazy, we belong in a psych ward way, like voices in our head. No, we're just always carrying on a dialogue within ourselves. We see a, a sign on the side of the road with a Coke and we think, oh man, that Coke looks good. We just see someone else's hair and we're like, oh, her hair looks nice. We see their shoes and like, we see their shoes, but then we're like, oh, my shoes are awful, and I'm ugly, and I'm stupid, and why did I say that? And I wish I was so much better at this, and all day long, we're day, you know, we call it daydreaming. We're daydreaming. We're talking. We're going through conversations that have never even happened. We are expecting outcomes that we have no idea how they're going to play out, and the problem is every one of us do this, but a lot of us have never even heard how destructive it can be if you don't get a hold on it. Because while we all do it, we don't all control it very well. I don't control it very well. It's something that I'm having to work on right now. And if we don't learn how to do that, just kind of talk about maybe self-talk and some of this. Self-talk. 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 After that, after okay. that, yeah. Okay, so self-talk is something that is kind of uh, a no-brainer. It's what you say to yourself. But it's all based on what you believe about yourself. And so that, again, comes from experiences, what life has taught me, the places that I've been hurt mostly. And so where my insecurities are. The the problem is that it doesn't usually line up. If you have a lot of negative self-talk in your mind, like if you make a mistake and you go, oh, I'm so stupid. Well, that just does a couple of different things. One, you thought it. Two, you said it, so therefore you heard it. Wow. And so it all becomes real. You're, you're just wow. ingraining that more and more and more into your yeah. mind. And so it becomes more and more of what you believe. It's like affirms the beliefs already that you have. And so which just creates this huge monster. And so what happens is um, every time you say that, it just gets more and more. It becomes more and more true. And so what you might notice if You've, and I'm sure you have already opened the Bible. You recognize that that God is is writing a love story, a love letter to you. He's saying to you how wonderfully and beautifully made you are, and how perfect you are, just by the way that He has created you. And yet, the stuff that you're actually believing, because that's what you're saying to yourself, is the opposite of that. Now, one thing also that the Bible says, and and this is de- paraphrase a little bit. Um, The Bible says, take your thoughts captive. Well, that tells us two things. This is so profound to me. One thing thing that that says is that, hey, there's going to be a need to. Right? Right? So so we're we're human. He's telling us, hey, you're human. You're going to have these negative thoughts, right? So there's going to be a need. But the other thing that it tells us is that God's never done, he's never asked us to do anything he didn't get, equip Absolutely. us to do. Yes, and so he tells us, hey, but that's okay. You, you can do this. You have the power to do this. So back, we're, we're back, kind of come full circle there with that. We have more power than we think Absolutely. we have. Yeah. And so, so God has given us the power to do that. And he's, asked, he's saying to you, hey, ask yourself, does this line up with what God says about me? So while I may not be an expert at, uh, I don't know, Josh, whatever it is you do. <laughs> that, <laughs> Everything. That's the I'm best sorry. question that's I been asked today. I could not remember what it sometimes. is because I'm sorry. Some, something about the... Filling up baptism tanks, social yeah, media. I don't, he does a lot of things, I know. Everything, everything. But, but while I may not be an expert at those things, it doesn't mean I'm stupid. It simply means that's not my expertise. Right. And so might it be okay then to say to yourself, well, that's just not your expertise. Like, I don't see children professionally. Not because I don't love children. I do love children very much. That's not my expertise. And I don't want to be jacking with a kid's head. Right, right. And what, (laughs) you know, I don't want to be, I don't want that, it's too much responsibility for me. Yes, ma'am. If if someone was dealing in, and say that there's people, I'm assuming that there is, someone was dealing with with poor self-talk, maybe, Poor self-image, depression, insecurity, it, just stuff like that, that. A lot of that comes from, from self-talk. A lot of that can be oh, changed yeah. with self-talk. Yeah. What is a good, just one, one first step that we can start taking to, to, to begin moving toward recovery or even just getting better at that? Well, the first question would be, does it line up with what God says about me? 
And what is, is it, is it in Ephesians, Ephesians, I don't know, I want to say Ephesians 4, I think there's a, uh, I saw it in a movie, I'm not sure, sure. <laughs> but to be honest, it was in that, uh, that new movie that just came out. But anyway, uh, Overcomer, that's right, and is it Ephesians? I think it is, yes, you saw the same movie. Anyway, it's in Ephesians where it starts talking about you. And, and the woman told her, said, every, as you read that, instead of whatever word is written there on the Bible, put your name there. Oh, yeah. I, and then it was so powerful. I mean, it was the only thing really I remember about the movie. It was kind of a good movie. But anyway, it was so powerful that she said to do that. And as the girl did that, she started to recognize what God says about her. So first of all, you want to, you want to say, does this line up with what God says about me? The second thing is, as you hear yourself do that, replace it with, no, that's not true. This may not be where I'm great, but it's my first time to do it. Like, me sitting here is not my expertise, per se. Killing it. Well, thank you. But, uh, and it makes me very uncomfortable, but here I see it. That's fantastic. I was talking to Sam just the other day, and I said... We were talking about this, about like, have you ever had that moment where you, like, you know you believe in God? You know what I'm saying? And then all of a sudden, just a thought pops in, and it's like, God's not real. Has anyone else ever had that moment where it's just like, man, is God even real? I don't know. I'm preaching. You know what I'm saying? And that, it still happens every now and then where you, I've seen God move. I've seen these crazy things happen. And it, still, it'll be like, mm, God's not real. I told her, I said, one of my favorite, oh, I'll, 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 hopefully I didn't interject there. Okay. One of my favorite things is what I do is I'm such a, I'm a very verbal guy. I don't, inter, I do internalize, but if I don't get it out, it like eats me alive. We don't have one convert, one argument where we don't talk about every like vein of it. Because if we do, I'm just like, oh God. So what I'll do is I have that thought and literally I've, I'm teaching myself to go. And it's funny, I'm a really millennial person. And I have this touch screen, screen that's in front of me that doesn't actually exist. And I'll go, I'll go, that's not real. I literally, I just have to do it. I, this random thought, man, you're too young to be doing this. I'm like, mm, no, God told me to do this. That's not real. You know, Alex, you're not really qualified to do it. Mm, I am qualified because God asked me to do it. I literally do it out loud. I say it out loud. I'm driving and I'm like, nope, that's not it. Mm -mm. I like, I swipe it into the trash can. But I say it out loud and I see it go into the, the proverbial trash bin that looks like the one on your computer screen. I'm like, no, nope, that, that belongs over there. But I, I say it because I, if when I say it, like she was saying, it helps me to believe it more. You know, I used to get up and this is me just being weird. But I literally, I struggled with image problems for a long time. I was super concerned what people thought about me. So I started getting up every morning and looking in the mirror and saying, good morning, beautiful. Like I would, I would do funny stuff like that. I know that's funny, but for me, it was powerful. Because I was very insecure about what I look like. And so I would out loud have to say, Alex, you look nice today. And I, I know some of you are going to think that's crazy, but I don't deal with what people think about me anymore. I have a higher self-esteem now because I started working on this right here. It was no longer about, man, what do they think about me? It was, ooh, what do I think about me? I think I look nice today. Go, Alex. You know? So I hope... <laughs> I hope I didn't just say anything that's totally opposite of what you No, you didn't. She's like, that's all wrong. No, no. no actually, it's all right. Uh, the one thing I did want to say, though, is the difference between believing in God and believing God. And, and that, that is, you can believe in God all day long, but if you don't really believe what he says, I mean, you know, what's the point of that? And, and so, because none of that, None of that negative stuff is what God says about us. Right. And so I can spend time thinking and thinking all those negative things, but really, why would I want to do that? Absolutely. Because either I believe him or I don't. Right. In a lot of things, it's just that black and white. And I try not to be a black and white kind of girl because, you know, it's not a concrete world we live in. There's a lot of gray area. But, um, but that, that really, for that specific thing... It is very much, do I believe him or not? Right. Oh, Why would I be this if that's, if God said I should be this? Right. If, you know, it just didn't make good sense to me. Since 
which I love the fact that you're a believer and you talk about the Bible and prayer unashamedly. I love that. Just tell your story. Tell us your story, Josh. Well, we start our sessions a lot with me talking um, and telling her how smart I am and I have all this stuff figured out in my life. And then um, it's usually how I start. So I usually, I was, I was going through this, this season in my life where I was really trying to, there was a lot of decisions that I had to make about a lot of different things. And so I had all these plans in my head of how I wanted things to look, what I wanted to do, how I was going to do it. Uh, I had all these decisions made, like they were firm. I believed them. I believed they were right. Um, and I shared those with her one, one, in one of our sessions, and it was about a 10-minute thing of like, I believe this, this, and this. I've already made this decision. This is how we're going to do this. This is how we're going to do this. And I had it all laid out. And she was like, what does God say about that? And I was like, <laughs> haven't even asked. I have no <laughs> idea. Uh, I really don't need God right now. I've got all this figured out. Like, uh, she crushed me with that. And <laughs> that's how a lot of our sessions are. I'm like, this is this issue. She's like, that's great. It's totally wrong, but it's great. But uh, that's kind of it's kind of hard. That's why I've been going for a year. You know, I haven't haven't learned everything yet. But she taught me how to give my day to God at the beginning of my day because I'm very busy in my head a lot. So I tend to wake up and go, okay, I have this, this, and this to do. This is what I'm going to do. And I haven't even talked to God about it yet. I've just talked to Josh. Um, so she taught me how to meditate on it in the morning and say, before you make a decision, before you do anything for the rest of the day, wake up, give your day to God, and ask him to make the decision for you, like to help you with all those decisions. And that's, it's been big for me because I didn't rely on God a lot before that moment to make those bigger decisions. I was just like, it comes from God because I feel like it, right? That's what you think. Like, <laughs> must be God talking because I agree with everything he's saying right now. So <laughs> that's kind of, that's, that's how it works but for me. But she's helped me with that a lot, especially like meditating on that, giving my day to God because we had to do that because Dee does a specialized thing called EMDR. And she had to teach me to, uh, to meditate, to, to calm my mind down, to be able to, to rest and to let some things go before we could do some of this therapy. So... Yeah, that was, that was huge for me. So I guess I wanted him to ask that and maybe present this to say, because it's pretty biblical. David wakes up and it says, I will awake the dawn. He gets up before he even starts his day. We find it all across the Bible. Jesus gets up before the sun rises. Does what? Spends time in prayer. So coming from, I mean, a professional opinion, knowing that we cannot separate physical and spiritual, how important is it to dedicate that time of day to spend in time with God, whatever that looks like, singing, worshiping, praying, reading our Bible. Does, do you do that? Is that a part of your life? Is It is. Um, when you think about tithing, I mean, just the concept behind tithing and how... <laughs> Stop. It's so good. I, I see where you're going, and I'm like, man. When you think about uh, tithing... God says give, uh, it's, the Bible says to give God your first fruits. Okay, so the very first thing. So the very first thing you're going to do when you wake up is you're first going to, uh, I would think, thank God that you woke up and nobody attacked you during the night. Uh, we live in Jackson, so, <laughs> you know, <laughs> that could be a real thing. Um, but, you know, just being thankful that you, that you awoke, but also just surrendering your day to God. I, I am, God has gifted me. That is pretty obvious, and I will accept that. And God uses me. I will accept that. But I am not all that. In that God is the one who brings healing to clients. God is the one who does that. To God be all of the glory. And the fact I made it through college by itself. I mean, that is just God. I know, Brother Some of our college students I'm with you. Life. I'm with you. And that is, you know, algebra. Listen. Oh, Lord, help us. See? See, I, could, I got a whole sermon on that. So to God be the glory. So I am not all that. And, and God is the one who brings the healing to these clients. And so the very first thing that I do is I open my eyes. I just surrender my day to God. Because as those people come, understand when those people come to me, the two things are happening. Because God is God. And I get all the omnis mixed up. So I think he's omnipresent. Oh, yes. 
Is that right? So he's, he's, in my, he's working in my life, and he's working in the client's life at the same time. They think they're coming to me because I'm an answer to their prayer. The reality to me is that they're coming to me because I've been praying that God would bless our practice. That's so good. And so, it's, you know, God is involved in all of that. And so for, for me not to pray for them, that God would heal them as they come to our practice, I am not all that. I do not have the power to heal people. God, on the other hand, does. And so my prayer first thing in the morning is, God, I'm just going to surrender my day to you. You know, you know that when people cancel or don't show up, I don't get all tore up about that. God knows what I need, and he knows what they need. And so I just leave that to him, and I go on doing something else. Sometimes I go for a walk, you know, whatever. So the idea is, for me in my own life, I wake up, and on most days, the first thing that I do, I know y'all are not Baptists, but I listen to Charles Stanley's sermon uh, you know, at first thing got, in the morning. We got lots of, this is a melting pot. Well, I know, I know. And, and, we and love so everybody. The idea is I just start my day with a sermon and I get my head on straight and I get my focus where it needs to be and I let God take it from there. But without that, I don't know how people, I don't know how they operate. I don't. That's, that's incredible. So with our last question today, do, do you think as a believer first, and then as a, um, a social worker second or therapist second, do you think that we can grow and reach, begin reaching our fuller potential in God without addressing this, what's happening right here? I don't. And the reason for that is because they, the, you cannot separate the spiritual from the physical. And there is brain development that happens. I don't know how many of you are here, less than 25, but for those of you that are, your brain's not fully developed yet. So young and dumb is a real thing. And and it's expected. And and so... I'm 26. I know, right? I'm just sitting next to this guy. Mind you. So he's barely crossed that I'm there. I'm there. So, so just thinking about that, you know, life is so difficult. Um, and, and as it happens, but again, because you can't separate the spiritual from the physical, when physical things happen, when things happen in this world, then we have to recognize that we're going to need God to get us through that. And we're going to need help from godly people to get us through that. And, and, and if you're not addressing the physical or the humanity of it, the human condition, then you're going to have trouble. I, I, I don't... I mean, you can get to heaven without doing that, I, you know, because Jesus is the way to heaven, but um, you're, it's going to make it harder than it has to be, is what, I guess what I'm saying. Would you guys give D. Wright a big overflow? Right? Would you guys stand up on your feet? Miss D, thank you so much for coming, being a part of today. This has been incredible. Uh, and while you're at it, would you just keep giving it up for Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith?